I mean, here I was going to America. You know, going to America, that's crazy. I see guys want to go to America now. You can find America in Runda here. That was America, you guys. Eh? <laughs> this was the first thing that I had done that had worked. Finally, I was a success, even to my peers. I was going to America. So I was trying to do all manner of things, trying to find the, that, that particular job, that one that will kick. So eventually it did. This job was hefty. It came with a company van, an unlimited fuel, uh, you know, uh, card. And, 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 and then I used to clock in through the phone. I mean, I would wake up in the morning and after, you know, after they're done training. So I would wake up and then I'd say, this is, uh, in those days I was Levi. Eh? Levi Coness becomes Levi Coates. You can imagine in your 20s you earn a bit of money like me. I bought a BMW that was not even, a, it was not even worth it. But I did it because I always wanted to own one, you know. And there I was, living in a condo in, uh, in, uh, in Chicago eventually before I, I, I got out. That was on the 23rd floor, overlooking the whole city. Paying $1,700 for it per week because of lifestyle. So really, after a while, I would clock in and not go. Now, because I've had money now, I'm tanga tying this fuel card I'm using, if I'm even fueling my sister's car, I'm fueling this dear buddy's car, I'm doing all manner of things. I ended up at a point where, when the American journey was coming to an end, it was a very heavy journey for me because I landed back here with nothing. The opportunities are so many. Yet, when you do not do anything with your life, it catches up with you. Hi, my name is Levi Kones. I am uh, a father, a husband, I'm an author, I'm also a journalist. I recently wrote this book called There Is No Useless Experience, which is basically many stories of my life combined together to bring in some lessons. For example, I talk about, uh, you know, my childhood and knowing your value and how you can be misused when you're young and in your 20s. I talk about how I went to the US and the things that happened there and how I got deported and came back. I talk about how I battled with cancer and what happened in my cancer journey as well as what has happened with me and the issues to do with weight loss and fighting weight. I also speak extensively about matters to do with self-discipline as well as matters to do with making money, you know, solving your problems by making money, as well as the interaction of social media and how I almost, or is it almost, or became, I think I'm banned from Rwanda an interesting uh, uh, story because of a tweet. Anyway, those are some of the things I talk about in my book. And let's get into it. I grew up in a family of four. Uh, had one elder sister and we were three boys. And I remember those years, we went to, uh, I would say good schools, although there were even government schools. I, I went to Plainsville Primary School. After some point, I think my parents were really looking for, like the you know, quintessential middle class family, they're always looking for that thing they can give their children better. And we went to, and I went to uh, Kalsa, and when I was in Kalsa, I got into a bit of trouble, and, and I had to be removed after a week. Yeah, it's uh, not, not a very good story, but you know, we waylaid a young uh, Indian boy, the guy, those, have those turbans, and we removed his turban. And apparently, that's uh, quite a taboo, so. Uh, the Asian community was up in arms and my dad, they think, thought something would happen to me and I was pulled out of that school. At some point in class seven, when they realized that I was getting into bad company, you know, hanging around Matatus, the, the Manyangas were then starting to come around South B, playing loud music and all that. And I think my parents felt, you know, this was not going to be a good environment for me. So they moved me to uh, Kaptagat Preparatory out in Wasingishu, which was an excellent school, a private school. I mean, this school had a swimming pool, it had horse riding, it had, you know, you were eating sausages in the morning, it was something else. And I began to mingle with children I had not mingled with before, who are what I would call, you know, the high class type. Uh, I should say this, I was in a Christian home with very strict conservative values, you know. We were not allowed to do a lot of things, you know. I couldn't even do a box, you know, which was the most famed hair cell at that time. In fact, the one time I tried to do a box and I walked around with a kofia for several days, it, in the house I was busted yeah, and matched, frog matched to the kinyozi and 
Chini. <laughs> so moving to Eldoret was okay because for the first time since my childhood, my parents now lived separately because my mother's job had not given her a transfer. So we kept a house in Nairobi. But my dad did move to Eldoret. He also got a house there. And for two or three years, we juggled back and forth, giving me some room for exploration. So about my father, um, we nicknamed him Saddam, me and my sister, uh, because uh, at that moment in time, Saddam was, Hussein was bombing uh, Kuwait, and we knew him as a dictator, a tyrant, and that is what we had attributed uh, to my dad. Uh, my dad was that guy who, his things had to work out a certain way. It was a more like a military style of thing. Eh? He, and I think in some ways it's good. Some things rubbed off on me, honestly speaking, because this guy, he paid his bills on time. He came to school when he was needed to come to school. He paid school fees on time. We were never sent home, uh, you know, for things like school fees, arrears and all that. But then he also looked at your work. So you came from, from school, he wanted to see you. what's your homework like? What have you done? Who, who are you hanging with? And you know, what are you doing with your holiday? You had to give him a timetable for your holiday. So for us, it was, a, it was a military, you know, environment. Hence the name Saddam. Now, in terms of relationship speaking, did we do anything really for fun? No, not much, I'd be, I'd be honest. We, we would never be caught like watching TV together, for example, because he would have something to say about programs that were not Christian, you know? And uh, as a result, I think there was that kind of drift between us. Uh, in terms of us, and I remember one time my, my sister had a coffee written uh, Chicago White Sox. And for some reason, my father read it as sex. Oh, I tell you, it was crazy. Either the somos we used to get and the, and the biblical teachings, it was, that was what seemed enough at that moment in time. And uh, I also remember one time I was watching a movie called uh, Passage of 57. It's a Wesley Snipes movie. It's really basically about, you know, Wesley Sniper, he goes into the airplane and he's uko, you know, kung fuing and high, you know, kicking everyone. And finally, you know, he, the plane has been, has been hijacked, but he takes it back. And my dad walked in and I had not noticed. And I was watching this movie and he said, what's that you're watching? And I said, ah, it's a person here with seven. What's that about? Oh, it's this guy. He goes, he hijacks the plane. There's some hijackers who take the plane and then he's taking it back from them. I'm done. Then he sends and he's like, hmm. So you want to be high, Jaka now. You know, unazima to TV, unaenda. You know. So it, in, in some ways, I, and I think many parents were like that, and I don't want to blame him because I think that was all they knew to do at that time. Given the fact that the world was also changing for them, much as it's changing for us as well, things were coming in, you know, these hairstyles were, were, were changing. Uh, rap music was just, and hip hop was just also, uh, uh, coming alive, no one was really understanding the, the language of Sheng. I, I can actually uh, relate now as a parent with what was happening, and all, the only way they knew how to do it was to throw, you know, the good book at it and throw the Christian principles. And I think that's what was happening with him. I, I, I was, uh, you know, resilient because I thought that, you know, some other homes I could see, the, the children were doing much different things in their particular homes. You know how those homes where guys are high-fiving their dads and they're all joking around with them and, and, they're, and they're going on trips. We went for one trip to Mombasa and that one trip, I remember it very well. You know, you know my, my dad was in trousers the entire time and <laughs> actually in a kaunda suit on the beach. So it, it's you, because I don't think he wanted to uh, show his legs, that would be a, an hour story all together. So... <laughs> Maybe there was a taboo in that. <laughs> but you know, they, as, a, as a result, the resilience came in in various forms because when I was in Form 1, uh, in my first time in Form 1, I got suspended, which was a big deal because first, it had never happened in the school I was in. And secondly, I was a Form 1 student. I mean, how does a Form 1 student get suspended in the first time? What did I do? What I did was, you know, I got involved with uh, some... Uh, elder students, Form 3s, Form 4s, who, because we were in a mixed school and they were going to visit uh, the girls' uh, dormitory, they needed somebody who was a lookout. So there I was, assigned uh, the, the job of a lookout as a, as a mono, 
and I climbed up a tree. In fact, we were two of us. And uh, our job was, you know, basically, kama kuna noma, you just say, kuku, kuku. So, <laughs> before we kukued twice, we had been caught by the watchman. And from March to the, to the headmaster's uh, office, the principal then. And we, it, because it was a few weeks to the end of the term, nothing much was said. You know, we were caned, the usual slasher, you know, you do all those things, kind of things. But when I went home uh, from school, because my sister was in the same school, she was given a letter to take to my dad. And that letter was a letter indicating that I had been suspended. I should come after two weeks when schools reopen with both my parents. So that letter was really the beginning of a major division between me and my dad, I think. Because uh, I think by that time he was really disappointed. And the way he reacted to it is when he came to school, he, he caned me in front of the whole assembly. Yeah. Which never improved relations between us at all. I think it was overkill because it was like, you know, he told, he actually volunteered, you know, the principal watcher, let me deal with this. I think he really wanted to smash that resilience that he was noticing. But in, in, in the process, I think it triggered something else in me in terms of just being defiant, especially not just to him, but to even what he was propagating in terms of, you know, uh, Christianity in terms of the Bible, the love of God. It was just like, that left me. I, did, I never joined the CU, for example, for the four years I was in high school. Never did. Yet my father would come and preach, even to the CU. I was never a member. I, I think that Kiboko has its place. I'm not one of those propagators who think that, you know, that, you know, don't, don't ever yeah, use the Kiboko. I think it also has, a, how do I call it, a shelf life, because there reaches a point where we have to have a discussion. You can't beat a 15-year-old. I mean, you could, but really, it will make more sense to sit them down and show them what, what they are doing wrong and tell them, you know, this is why. You know, and also tell them about yourself. The other thing I lacked was the ability to, for someone to open up. And, this, and you'll notice that in my book, I have tried to be very candid because I lacked that candidness myself in terms of, you know, somebody telling me that these are the mistakes I made. This is how I got out of them. And it's okay, you do screw up in life. And you do bounce back from, you know, the messes that you make. Now, um, in terms of the kiboko growing younger, well, it was necessary. There were points, of course, we were true and, you know, and only a kiboko could correct uh, uh, those kind of things. But like I say, there's a shelf life. You can't kiboko everything out. So, you know, by the time I was uh, 16, 17 years old, I already had fairly good driving school skills, which by the way, I want to attribute to my dad, because I think, uh, and, and, I, and I want to say, he didn't set out to teach me. Here's what happened. We were stealing his car. Often, you know? Most times those days, I think he had a lot of trips. So when he had a trip, so what we would do is we would, uh, me and some friends of mine, would go to the car and we would put charcoal marks beside the tire. Yeah? So that would arudisha pale. You know, you know? It really helped our parking, by the way. We, we, there's very few parking spaces I cannot get into as a result of that. Sometimes, you know, those people will say, ati, ati, kuja, kuja, boss, kuja, boss. I'm like, that. sometimes they're like, boss, I got this. Washa <laughs> natunayo. Anyway, so we would steal the car and then we would bring it back. And it, it wasn't overnight in the beginning. It was like on an afternoon that like he's gone and we are all testing. In that testing, changing of gears, because those days it was only manual cars, was a major problem. So this one time we came up and this was before now we moved to uh, Elroyd. We came up the, the road on, uh, uh, I think it's called Bunyala Road, yes? You go up the, up the hill, who could you? It was not as wide as it is right now. It used to be like a two-lane thing. So somewhere, who could you, we, the car choked. Now, because we did not know how to engage, you know, two to one well, we were stuck. Only thing we could do is just kind of get the brake. And the policeman came. In those days, policemen were really kind people. You know, eh. Hey. <laughs> that is a, a message. <laughs> this policeman looked at us, two boys in the car, a car he doesn't know, asked us where we stayed from and drove us home. Handed us over to. Uh, then, you know, there was an aunt in the house, so she was told about it. So later on, my dad came and found out. So when he found out about it, 
the strangest thing happened. For the first time since the history of Saddam, he didn't react the way he would normally have reacted. You know what he did? He took me to the car the following day and told me, so you can drive, drive. And I began, you know, stuttering, you know, your dad is there, so you cannot even move the vehicle, you're, you're starting it, it's just... But over time, he began to teach me what to do. And so by the time I was 15, I was driving. By the time I was 16, I was doing errands. By the time I was 17, I was doing even long distance, because then, by then we had some vehicles that were doing long distance, these pujos. Uh, when I, the moment I was able to attain the age of 18 years, I got a license immediately. You know, I began even driving lorries. So, tractors, you name them. As a result, I was one of the few young people in those days who was able to, to drive and drive well. Now, what happened was, word quickly went round, you know. People see me driving my dad's pickup, doing errands, all that. So, mze, so and so calls you. Hey, can you do this for me? Hey, can you do this for me? And that's okay because at that moment in time, you're gaining experience. Yes, you're also wanting to be uh, respectful to your elders. But unknowingly, you begin to lose your value. So people see you as an errand boy, but they never compensate you for the same. So what you get is, you know, a plate of food, a pat on the back, you know, 500 shillings, you know, something that would never be, if they took a driver, they would never pay for. And as a result, because of it, and your, your, your own self, you know, degradation in terms of unapeana heshima, you never ever quote. Then you take that with you into your 20s. You take it with you into your 30s. So you become Mr. Nice Guy who never knows how to quote right because you're trying to please people. And that's what I really meant by knowing your value. Not because you cannot give um, you know, services uh, for free, because sometimes I do that even myself, even now. If somebody will call me and they'll ask me for a favor and hey, why not? But beware, there's a thin line between too many favors and loss of value. And that happens a lot to young people. You've got, I mean, you have a good skill. You're a camera person. You're always shooting for people, but you're never paid for it. And then somebody comes who's a big time photographer and they get a lot of money for it. Because that person is aware of their value. Because once you carry that to your work environment, that's what happens. You end up in a place where, especially those of us who are in the media industry, where you're earning this X amount of pay, so and so is doing the same job as you, they're earning four times your figure. You can never negotiate. You never learned how to, so you can't because you're happy to get the job. I mean, everyone knows jobs are scarce in Kenya already. So now you, you keep on having excuses for yourself to press yourself down value wise. And then you realize it hits you hard when you're 40. Hey, I never traded on my value. Maybe I could have done different. I have seen people, the other day I saw a social media influencer put up a, a price tag for herself and people said, ah, not too much. And I was thinking, that girl, she knows her value. And this is not a message to young people to go and be and, you know, busy, charge people, you know, obscene amounts of money for services. But start somewhere. Charge something. Right, so after I finished high school, I didn't uh, get the kind of marks that could take me to to the university I had wanted personally, if I had been asked <laughs> to study law. But I think uh, no one really asked me, what do you want to be? And I don't think I really personally interrogated the question myself very, very hard. So there I was, I finished high school, and next thing I know, um, you know, Saddam has brought me this application letters for, for KMTC. Um, not application, really. He's brought me a letter telling me I've been accepted into, into KMTC. So there I am, admitted to KMTC in Nairobi to do clinical medicine, to go and be a, a doctor. You know, even, even clinical medicine wants to make a tiary. Oh, you're on the way there. And it's a very lucrative course, no, no doubt about it. And you know, at, at that moment in time, even more lucrative because in that year, they were taking only 45 people or something like that. And the, and the matter was not lost on me. It was said even in the prayer meetings as we are going, you know, Father, you know, he was among the 45 and all that. So, <laughs> so I went to, I uh, came back to Nairobi to, to go to KMTC. First lesson was anatomy, physiology. I hated it. I thought this is not the thing for me. You know, there, I don't know. There are those things you just start and you know over here, I don't belong here. But I kept at it for a year. 
And for that one year, I didn't do all badly, but in the second semester, I was done. So, so I think instead of me sitting down and you know, telling my dad I could have done this or that or the other, I began just to be a truant in school. I started missing classes. At that moment in time, my mama had also moved to Eldoret, but uh, we had kept a house in Nairobi, so I was using it you know, for, uh, to go to school and also for my own uh, uh, escapades to throw parties in it and things like that. So, of course, you know, the proverbial 40 days came and the, and the exams came out and there I was, I had flunked, you know, uh, horrendously and I was supposed to do a supplementaries and repeat the year. I refused to do that. And my dad's like, what do you want to do? And I'm thinking, ah, shipping management. So off I went to do shipping management. Six months in, not the thing for me. I jumped out of that one. I did another business management course. I jumped out of that one. So by the time I was going to the US, which was the year 19, in early of 1999, my parents were just fed up with my stories. I was that guy who just did not know what I wanted to do. My sister had gone a year earlier. She, you know, my sister was more structured than myself. She got out of high school. She got into Baraton uh, University. She started studying, got there two years in. She got a, a scholarship to a university in, in the US and boom, she transitioned to go and do biochemistry. Serious things, you know. <laughs> and there I was, <laughs> uh, joke me doing all the manner of, uh, you know, hop, skip and jump. So uh, she sent a letter from there to me telling me apply, apply for sports medicine at this university. So sports medicine, did I know what sports medicine was? Uh, there was no Google and no time to find out, but hey, sports medicine it is. So I applied, I got an I-20 from the uh, University of Washburn in Kansas, and, uh, and then I got an, uh, you know, an acceptance. Then it was time to go for, for, for the visa. So when I had the acceptance, I showed my mom, I told her, hey, I need to a visa, you know, facilitate this thing. I don't think they believed I would get the visa. To be honest, <laughs> in those days, you know, the 1998 bombing had just happened and the American embassy had moved to some makeshift structure up on Mombasa Road, somewhere. There was, there were people being denied visas there, like, you know, like there's not, in fact, you used to go there and there used to be this lady, she was like half American, half Chinese. Her job was just to say no. I think she was put there for that, that particular, <laughs> <laughs> that particular story, I, that lady was telling guys no. And you know, they, and they, and they say no and they have a loudspeaker. So, so what are you going to study in America? I think she had an accent and like a Chinese one there also. Uh, blah, 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 blah. No, come next year. So when it got my turn, you know, I was, you know, you, you are looking and you're thinking, there are at least three counters. The hope is that as people are moving and you can see your number is about to come up, you don't end up at the no counter. But that's where I ended up. You know, I actually even did I, I'm like, oh, yeah, what will happen? So I ended up there. And she asked me, she told me, uh, what are you going to study? I said, sports medicine. Do you know what it's about? I said, yes. What is it about? I said, oh, it's, uh, you know, it's medicine that is uh, designed especially for athletes, uh, ligaments, injuries, those kind of things. She says, um, okay, do you play any sports? Yes. What do you do, swimming? What are your favorite uh, uh, strokes? I told her. So she asked me, what strokes are there in swimming? First of all, I said there are four strokes. Ah, backstroke, breaststroke, uh, you know, uh, freestyle, and uh, fly, you know, or butterfly. What's your favorite? I said freestyle, or crawl. It's called crawl as well. She's like, hmm, I see you even know the slang. I said, yeah, come for your visa too. Same day, come for your visa too. Those days, visa in a pewana, hapo. Hey, bro, I left that place, you know, singing hallelujah. I mean, here I was going to America. You know, going to America, to squeeze it. I see guys want to go to America now, and the squeeze of America was America. Say here at America, yeah, squeeze uh, we can We can see it on TV. It's not, you can find America in Runda here. That was America, you guys. Huh? <laughs> so anyway, I went, <laughs> I went home with my passport with a visa stamped all the way to Eldoret, you know. Uh, of course, uh, yeah, they, they, they called, uh, you know, a celebration, prayers were held. My former principal, the late uh, Samiga Shingishi, is the one who came to pray for me. 
you know, my, he was my principal at Captagat, and he was so happy. He was like, you know, you go, you go get him, Nini, what? And a fundraiser was held. Money was changwad. Although it was not, in those days, people never used to changa so much money. It was just enough money to buy the air ticket. They gave you the air ticket, maybe you get the first semester, then you go. So you're going to the land of plenty. It wasn't, it was never a big deal. People used to know, all you just need to do is just get that money and get out. Nowadays, I hear people putting a big story over there. Oh, you, they want five million shillings from who? <laughs> you want us to pay for your four years? Eh? So, this was the first thing that I had done that had worked. You know, you can imagine all the other things had not worked well. Here I was, I had left high school and everything else had failed. MTC had failed. So you, uh, KIM had failed, this shipping management school had failed, and here I was now, finally, with a visa in hand. Finally, I was a success, even to my peers. I was going to America. There was no beating that. But you know, before I went to America, something happened. And uh, we went for, my friend and I, uh, I think he, he'll appreciate me naming him, Habert. <laughs> He's still my boy. Habert and I went on a, you know, on a throwdown party for a, a farewell thing, really. We were in Nairobi, uh, like the day before I left, and we went for a party and I was taking concoctions. You know those things, they, they, they bring you CG, pina colada with what, CG, ni, ni, ni. you're trying all those things because you know you're about to fly out. And I got drunk. And it was in the afternoon and I'm flying out in the evening. So I'm so drunk by 4 p.m., my flight is at 10 p.m. And uh, we were, you know, doing this farewell party at my, my auntie and uncle's house in Nairobi. In, up of Fungo Estate. So really, by the time I got home, everyone kind of knew. I mean, the boo, the smelling of the booze, the, the behavior. And my dad had put his foot down and said, it's not happening. But my uncle and my aunt prevailed upon him, you know, said, please, just let the guy go. So And by nine o'clock, I was somewhat steady enough to be taken to the airport. So. It was a very quiet ride to the airport, that's what I remember. Uh, very shameful, of course, because here yeah, I was going to America where people were just celebrating and all that. Here yeah, I was drunk, what, and leaving the same day. And that is how I left. With all that had been going on in the day, all I wanted to sleep. And I woke up only to the announcement that we were landing in Paris, Paris, France. And it was from there that the reality, you know now you're sobered up, the reality hit me. I really messed up on my, on, on my leaving. And you know in my, in my book, and that's why I say sometimes, that sometimes in life, the messes we do, you know, the screw up is right at the beginning. Because with what happened in America, the, you know, a bad start became a bad ending. You know, landing in America was already an experience. I landed during the snow. You know, first of all, ni mambo ya snow, unangalia, hey. I, I remember the cars looked all so new, you know, coming from the airport. When you're here, you can see some very rickety vehicles, eh? Things what were mechikilia paka na makamba ni nini. Hakuna yo story. Hakuna moshi, sui mayambaya. This is the place I, I needed to be. And uh, of course, once that bubble wore off, and because I was landing in November and my schooling was in January, I spent a lot of time in the house. So initially, it's the excitement of watching all those soaps that you had. Because those days, the soaps we were watching in Kenya were behind by some years. The ones in the US, the latest ones. So you're watching them, and then you're calling back home, and you're saying, hey, you know what has happened to Ridge Forrester? You're spoiling for, the, for guys back home, and you them, those kind of things. And also, I ran up quite some huge phone bills because I kept calling back. Uh, talking to my friends. Those days I had a girlfriend in Kenya who I was calling a lot. And, uh, and, and that got me into a lot of trouble with my sister because when the bills came, our monthly bills, it was really, you know, they came from Sprint and Sprint had work had some crazy bills over there. I think it was $730 I, I ran up the first month. The apartment that we lived in eh, had some cleaners who were white and like, I, I could not just get enough of that. Just... <laughs> <laughs> oh, just because, by the way. <laughs> so anyway, those months went by in a blah. And of course, school started and uh, reality hit home. You know, now I have to start learning and stuff. And I began learning. I also got a job. My first job I got was in a warehouse. 
And uh, I was in that warehouse. I had to do a training to learn how to drive a forklift, which was a very lucrative position at that moment in time because forklift drivers were not so many. Thankfully, I had a bit of driving experience. But you know, with forklift, it's a little bit different. The gear works and the stuff and the fact that you have to put the pulleys up and down and make sure that you swing into tighter spaces and stack up things. But I got really good at it. So because I got get really good, I got so many hours. As a result, I began to see now my own money. Ah, that body changed me. Ah, earrings. I still have holes in my ears. You know, sometimes my daughters want to, you know, the other day they were pushing something through here and it entered. And I was telling them, look, you guys. They're like, ah, stay like that. I'm like, where? <laughs> ah, you know, and uh, uh, I dreadlocks, you know. I think God punished me with a bald head because of the way I did things to my hair. I had dreadlocks. I, why? Nani, who could not? I wanted to be like Ruth Van Gullit. You know, I remember Van Gullit was that guy for, for Netherlands who was to play for the, Net the Dutch team. Hey, you guy. Got a tattoo back there. Thankfully, it is not somewhere conspicuous. So, <laughs> unless you really get to know me, you're never going to see that. that. <laughs> uh, but you know, those are all rebellious acts. You know, now I'm not at home, my father is not here, what can he do? You know, those kind of things. So you're getting jobs. And I was always looking for a better job. So I really job, job hopped. And in the US, if you want to work, especially in those days, there were jobs. Jobs are plenty. So I did everything. I did that, uh, you know, for some time I did you know, warehouse, then I was like a partner. They started going into uh, some sort of recession because there's some jobs that quisha over summertime, then they pick up again. You know, so they quisha over winter, pick up at summertime. So I find myself doing telemarketing, didn't like it. I went and, you know, washed trucks, didn't like it. I went and did, worked in a mint, I didn't like, I've worked in a gas station, I've worked in a, you know, an old people's home. I was taking these old guys, we used to go watch movies, you drive them back in the evening. So I was trying to do all manner of things, trying to find the, that, that particular job, that one that will kick. So eventually it did. I got a job with a, with a Coca-Cola Mid-America Mid company as a, you know, uh, first as a sales manager and then a territory uh, sales manager. And that job was awesome. It, it first it had a salary, which was not something that was, uh, you know, usual. Usually you'd be paid every week. Salaried people were called the moneyed people because they would get money like every two weeks or every month, but it was hefty. This job was hefty. It came with a company van, an unlimited fuel, uh, you know, uh, card. And, 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 and then I used to clock in through the phone. I mean, I would wake up in the morning and after, you know, after they're done training. So I would wake up and then I'd say, this is, uh, in those days I was Levi, eh? Because I was, Levi Cones becomes Levi Cones. So I was Levi Cones. So, <laughs> so I'll be calling in in the morning, 6.45 a.m. I'm like, this is Levi clocking in. You've clocked in by phone. Now your job is to get the van, go around uh, all, the, all the, like if it had stalls, like the way we have got some supermarkets. Eh? So you go to all the supermarkets to make sure that your brand is you know, put in the right places, it's displayed well, the, the sales managers who are there are doing their jobs, you know, if there is an issue with a lack of whatever brand, and Coca-Cola has got a lot of brands, more brands than we've ever seen here. In fact, some of the things, you know, Minute Made is a Coca-Cola product, yeah? And Coca-Cola has got some flavors that are not, especially in Fanta, that I've never seen in Kenya. So all these brands had to be, to, to be set up and you have to follow all, all of them. If there's an issue with a brand doing badly, you have to take notes about it. So that was my job during, during the day. But I clock out at 3 p.m. by phone. So really, after a while, I would clock in and not go. You know, I'm clocking in, I'm in another state even. Now, because I've had money now, I'm tanga tying this fuel card I'm using, if I'm even fueling my sister's car, I'm fueling the dear buddy's car, I'm doing all manner of things. And I was never busted with that particular issue. The only issue that came to the fore that became a problem was after a while, because in this particular uh, time, my lifestyle of partying was way up there. And you know, in your 20s, by the way, you know, thank God for your 20s. In your 20s are those years where you can, you can be in a club till morning today, and tomorrow you're at work. And the following day, you're clubbing. And the next day, you're at work. You're like the Energizer Bunny. I can't imagine that now. Nowadays, I sit even till 1 o'clock drinking tea. 
and I'm recovering for half the day the following day. You know this? <laughs> In Africa, 9.30, you're like, ah, eh? you're getting older. You're planning things around your sleep. You're like, um, we to traffic home, sign in, you're four o'clock, you're calculating hours of sleep. Who was doing that? You know? And I'm telling you, young people, e youth is bliss, my brothers and sisters. It's quishine. Jifanyeni tu apo. So, here I am doing that, you know, Thursday night, I mean, a reggae thing. Friday night, we are, we are doing hip hop somewhere. Saturday night, you're doing karaoke. And that lifestyle is continuing and continuing and continuing. And one day at my job, and I was pretty good at my job, honestly speaking. In fact, I was meeting all my targets, no issues. But the thing that was suffering was school work. In fact, after my first big paycheck came from Coca Cola, I just looked at it and then I thought, See, this is why we go to school. See, this is why we go to school. I quit school in a half and a half. I didn't say I quit. I just stopped going. The school looked for me. Mm -hmm. They kind of gave up on the story. In this day and time, you can't do that, by the way. You quit school today, even one semester, you're going to be back home on the weekend flights. Hakuna jokes. I think people like us, really messed up for the guys who are there, Poleni, and yeah, Poleni. We messed up. I was there on what is called an F1 visa, it's a student visa. It's not, you're not even supposed to work so many hours, it's supposed to be 20 hours. But you know those days what would happen? You'd get in, then you get someone to make for you a social security card. They'd give you the number, but then the number would say not allowed to work. So somebody else would make you another card. They would remove that cabana that says not allowed to work. So then with that one, anytime you present it, you look like an American citizen and no one questions your citizenship at all. So you get jobs Americans would get, like this one at Coca-Cola. Until they wanted to do, they had a change of management, I think, or something like that, and then they wanted to just review employee files, and they said, oh, as you bring your, uh, your, your paperwork, please bring proof of your American citizenship. And then that day I went, you know, I was told at work by my boss, so I, I thought about it, and then I went home. I thought about it. I told my sister, this is what they want. They want the American citizenship. She just told me, hey, you're cooked. Now, you see, if I don't provide proof that I'm an American citizen, it means I've been working illegally. If I've been working illegally, that's a federal offense. That's jail time to begin with. It'll end up in deportation. So what did I do? I opted to resign. I had to resign. I had to resign from the job I really wanted, you know. So I wrote a resignation letter and I moved out of state. I went to visit, I went to live with a friend. The friend I called, I told him, okay, I'm coming. And he lived in uh, 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 Atlanta at that time. And packed my bags, put them in the, in the car, told my sister, adios, going to start a new life. And that's how I found myself leaving the, the backward state of Kansas for Atlanta, Georgia, you know? which was really fast paced and really different from what I'd been used to and full of blacks as opposed to this predominantly very shags modus town had been. So if, 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 if Kansas was, was fast in terms of getting jobs, then Atlanta was really the place to be. Although the costing of living was very high, you know, getting an apartment was much more expensive than uh, Kansas. So I was living with these two friends. Uh, one of them was from back home in Elred. She gratefully, you know, uh, is the one who actually hooked me up. The other guy, I met him there, Kenyan, who had been there for many years, is still there. And uh, the two of them were also quite, uh, you know, uh, the party animals. So for some time as I was looking for a job, you know how it is, okay, kind of at, you not after a job, but uh, the more you're not getting a job, the more, the more you end up so it reached a point I had to move out. But as I was moving out, I got a job with uh, a gas station, which was not a big job. You know, you're, job, you're in a petrol station, you're the guy at night who is, you know, telling for people things and stuff like that. So I worked there for two weeks and I was earning like a fraction of what I used to earn. So even the house I got was in a dingy part of Atlanta. But then something happened. Some guys came and uh, gave me an idea. They were like, hey, gas station, you know how Kenyans are. It's a new boss. So, I began buying now from a supermarket, put in the gas station, I sell my own beer instead of the, instead of the, the and I made a lot of money, 
It's, it, it actually financed my lifestyle for a while. And uh, that situation at Atlanta did not last long. Uh, I, I talk about it quite at length, uh, you know, uh, in the book. And I talk about the, the aspect that, you know, I got into a relationship at that point in time also that didn't also go very well. And then I ended up in Chicago. And in Chicago, I, you know, I moved there predominantly because there were some two ladies who were moving out of Atlanta to Chicago. They, you know, we had met each other in the social circles. They're like, oh, so we can move in together. Those sides. Let's look for house. I'm like, I'm game. I mean, I'm that guy who's just going, you know. And this is like uh, four years into my American stay. So we moved into Chicago. I got a job with Motorola Company. For a while, it was okay. And I also got another job with the Chicago Tribune. It was my first dalliance with the media because I used to write a few articles for them on, you know, and also sell newspapers to, uh, to people over the phone. And that worked out well for some time. And then the Motorola company in that particular area shut down. They moved their plant somewhere else. So there we were, jobless again. It was at this point that, like the prodigal son, I began thinking maybe I should go back to, to Kansas. And I began talking to my sister. I said, you know, maybe I should come back there. Maybe we should restart this thing and look at it a little bit differently. You know, because the parting lifestyle had not idea me much. And uh, things had not worked out so well. So you can imagine in your 20s, you earn a bit of money like me. I bought a BMW that was not even a... I mean, that, that car costed me so much in terms of parts. It was not even worth it. But I did it because I always wanted to own one. You know, and there I was living in a condo in, uh, in, in Chicago eventually before I, I, I got out. But I was on the 23rd floor overlooking the whole city, paying $1,700 for it per week because of lifestyle. I think, by the way, if we go and look at my Kuna, kuna Omera something Okondani somewhere, yeah, maybe it's the coffee. You know, some guys think I'm <laughs> from the lakeside. But <laughs> there is like a something. Eh? My wife keeps on telling me, where, 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 where? I'm like, because she says I'm a... I'm like a spendthrift, although I'm trying. You know, when you talk about pressure from back home, the, one of the things I thank God for was that social media had not taken off the way it has now. You know, we would write a letter home. Then it would arrive after three weeks. Then they write a letter back to you. Then it's after three weeks. If you really want it to get quickly, you've got to FedEx it or to, you know, DHL it. And uh, you send your own pictures, you know. We would send pictures, the ones we've selected. Imagine if social media was there. Imagine it would be double the expectation in trying to prove things. Because even, even then, we were sending pictures of our cars. Hey, I bought this car. This is where we live. This is what. And you're selling it to your bros. So my brother, wana onyesha, kijiji yote inajua. Kuna brother, our same as He's doing things in the States. And, and, and that, of course, is a, is a, is a thing that is also, is also driving you, the aspect of you're not home. You really want to uh, prove... A, Prove a fact. But then there was also the thing of proving Kenyans to Kenyans right there. And they have it quite a bit. I mean, guys will go and rent vehicles and come and you know, come to a party and, and try to show off and pull it off as it's, it's a new car for themselves. Because, you know, unlike here, you can rent a pretty brand car and show up with it. And you can make it look like yours. And some of those cars are not even branded. The only thing that will tell you it's an insurance car is if you open the dashboard and looked at the insurance. But even if the guy removed it there, you never know. Just tell you, I bought this car, I'm doing well, ni, ni, ni. and the guy is going back to a shanty somewhere in some state. And there's always that thing we're always trying to prove. In fact, I remember one time I had shell another friend of mine, Maze. Maze to Kongam Bote. You know, you know, I think I'm back on your boss to Kongambo. We're both here, you know, there's <laughs> look around you. This is America. <laughs> My goodness, I can't believe, that, you know, you've asked, have I been able to do something tangible for myself? Good Lord, nothing. You know, one of the greatest regrets of life is the misuse of the 20s, because the energy is abounding. You know, the abilities there, the opportunities are so many. Yet when you do not do anything with your life, it catches up with you. It really does. 
it doesn't matter how much, you know, sometimes I might write a book and look like, oh, so I've got learned my lessons and I have, you know, uh, started doing something. But you know what? I am 20 years late. You know, what I will, what I can only do now is play catch up. But I can't get it back. There's always, there's that, there's an effect that is long lasting. That is ungainable. Let no one cheat you at your oh, CG in Arudi 50 times 50. No, not that easily. They still, you know, the consequences, the Bible tells us what? That the, the wages of sin is death. There's a cost for the things you're doing. And that cost has to be met. It's either met by your inability to function the way you would have functioned, like I tell you now, oh, I'm no longer 20. If you call me right now and tell me at TV, I won't do something till 4 a.m., I'll have to structure it. You know, there's a cost. I can no longer do that and tell myself at Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Recently, I was busy just, I, I went to Nakuru, came back, went to Mombasa, came back, and then I was sick for three days. Now, you tell. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's not sickness that's tangible. You know, you doctor and you like, you know what? End of music. Now you're fatigued. Now, imagine those are rich people problems. What is that? <laughs> so there's a cost to these things. So did I do anything? No, I didn't do anything. And that is how I ended up at a point where when the American journey was coming to an end, it was a very heavy journey for me because I landed back here with nothing. Okay, so the events that led to me coming back. <laughs> Ooh, it's time the story up. <laughs> that is a very bad story. You know, they, they, uh, you know, can I just read from the book? Because <laughs> I feel sometimes, you know, sometimes I want to tell myself, did that really happen to me? And you know, you kind of said it's like a, it's like a movie. At that point in time, it doesn't sound like it's a movie, it's a reality, only that when you look back, you're like, wow, really God, wow. So anyway, this thing started with me wanting to go back to Kansas.